Sweden. For decades, people have been coming here to try to learn the secrets of this country's multiple success stories. In openness and transparency, innovation and new technologies, in healthcare, welfare and gender equality. But lately, there's been a growing chorus of Sweden skeptics. You look at what's happening last night in Sweden. Sweden! Malmo is now the rape capital of Europe. They paint a picture of a country where openness and liberalism have created a nightmare that now threatens the very existence of those values themselves. Two contradictory narratives, they can't both be true. So what's really going on? A spectacular bridge, well known to fans of Scandinavian crime drama, connects Denmark to the Swedish city of Malmö. But it's real crime that's worrying people here, and some are blaming immigrants. During the crisis of 2015, Sweden took in more refugees per capita than even Germany. Hundreds of thousands came, attracted by an open-door policy and generous welfare payments. Many settled in an area of Malmö called Rosengard, already home to a large immigrant population. In the past, there have been riots here. Cars burned. Earlier this year, the police station was bombed. Part of Rosengard, just over there in fact, has been designated by the Swedish police as a vulnerable area one of 23 such areas across the country. Now, there are those who say that's just putting a positive spin on it. What this is, is a no-go zone, a ghetto where crime is spiralling out of control. Young guys don't have much to do, so, oh, let's have some uh, fights with the police. Glenn Sjogren is one of the city's most senior police officers. It's what they call the worst area. This is the worst area? Yeah. The biggest problems here are drugs and guns. Ten people have been shot dead in Malmo this year already. So when was the last time you had a shooting here? Uh, two weeks ago. Hey. Two uh, weeks ago? Yeah. Where was that? Just around here, 100 meters away. Just here? Yeah, that's right. That's him? That's him, yeah. Do you know who did it? Oh, we think we know. You think you know? Yeah. Have you arrest, made an arrest? No, nope, not yet. yet. One of the most sensitive topics here is about immigration. And some people say that it's immigration that's to blame for this rise. I don't think so. You don't think so? No, no. no. But who's doing these shootings? Are they, are they called Sven and Bjorn and do they have blonde hair? Normally not. Right. No. Sweden has, in recent years, also seen a rise in the number of reported rapes and sexual assaults. Lawyers say the police are struggling to cope. It is like that right now, and that's very bad, because if we have uh, police working with rape cases, and then we have a lot of shootings in Malmö, they need to take police from this who's working with that usually, so they have to work with the shooting instead. And that means that the rape cases are piled, so they have to wait. OK, let's pause here for a moment. That's part of the story, but there's more. The figures are highly contested. Sweden has broadened the legal definition of rape in the past few years. Look at what Ulrika Rogland told us before that clip we just showed you. What is going on with rape figures in Sweden? Are they up or are they down? Uh, I think they are up, but uh, it's rather difficult to say why they are up. I think it's a good thing that they are up. To me, it means that more people are reporting them. You don't think that more people are actually being sexually assaulted and raped? No, I don't think so, because we have known for many years that we have uh, a lot of people who don't report, uh, especially in the homes where the most uh, uh, assaults are committed. When journalists go to report on a story, we strive for accuracy and balance, of course. But we often also go in search of a narrative. And in complex situations, one narrative 
can eclipse another. Let's go back to Rosengard and start again. Part of Rosengard, just over there in fact, has been designated by the Swedish police as a vulnerable area, one of 23 such areas across the country. What does that mean? That means they have problems with crime, with unemployment, but this is still Sweden, right? How bad can it get? Young guys don't have much to do. Glenn Sjogren has been a police officer in Malmö for four decades. The rate of crimes in, in Malmö is going down. Really? Yeah. But everyone says they're going up. No, that's not. What's going up is uh, spectacular shootings. The biggest problems are, indeed, drugs and guns. The latest shooting was just a couple of weeks ago. Who was the guy who was shot? He lived there. Just a local resident? Selling drugs, of course. He was a drug dealer? Yeah, oh, of course. Yeah. You knew about him? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Every, every, everyone that got shot in Malmö is a well-known criminal. Right, so it's, it's the, the criminals are shooting each other? That's right. There are no innocent victims? Nope. Let's take another look at that sensitive question about immigration. Who's doing these shootings? Are they, are they called Sven and Bjorn and do they have blonde hair? Normally not. Right. No. OK. But you don't think it's to do with immigration? No. OK. So explain that. Yes. These guys are, 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 um, have, have not su succeeded in the school, they don't have a job and so on. Of course, they're immigrants, but not. They're second or third generation. So they're actually Swedes. Both versions of what we've just shown you reflect reality, but it doesn't take much to tip a narrative. This is a story about a wider gulf in perception between the image that Sweden projects and the lived experience of some Swedes which has begun to contradict that narrative. To understand the origin of Sweden's image as a beacon for progressives and liberals, you have to go back to the middle of the 20th century. Politics was dominated by the Social Democrats, a party with its roots in the labour movement that, through a bold hybrid of socialism and liberalism, appeared to achieve startling results. These are the richest people in the world. They have the highest standard of living in a super welfare state which has abolished poverty and eliminated strikes, where everything and everyone works. The only country in the world where seven-year-olds attend lessons on sex. Sweden projected itself as a model to emulate. But even in the 1960s, there were people asking, is the good Sweden narrative too good to be true? All around the town, you can see the discrepancy between the Swede as he is and as he'd like to be. They worship themselves in images of bronze, but are the trolls and gremlins creeping back? One thing the Swedes have always worshipped is the sun. That discrepancy is even starker today. Sweden still regularly comes at or near the top of international rankings for happiness and prosperity but it spends less than it used to on welfare and public services. We have been so lucky here. Now I think we have started to see difficulties in the society and they don't necessarily have to do with immigration at all, but now people see that my kid's school is not working, my elderly parents are not being taken care of in a proper way, um, or the, the, the buses or the trains are not working, they're always running late. So I think that people are feeling that they're doing everything right, but they're not getting back the welfare that we were used to. The heyday of Sweden's liberal socialist hybrid is over. Old industries have died, others have sprung up to take their place. The transition to a more globalised economy and a more educated workforce has been good for some, but not for everyone. It has produced a Sweden that is less equal and less homogenous. Of course, there are elements of truth and of exaggeration in both of these narratives. But the good Sweden story, the story of this perfect little nation where everything works and everyone lives in harmony, has been so dominant for so long 
that now that it's being challenged, it feels all the more disturbing. To get beneath the skin of the bad Sweden narrative, that the country isn't working anymore, you have to leave the city and get out into the countryside. An hour's drive from Malmo, we meet Morgan Nilsson. He's in construction. I have been working for since I was 18 and now I'm 52. Right. So I work in construction my whole life. And everyone who works was a social democrat. It was the party of the working man. Yeah, yes. And you, you've been in the union and everything. Now, he says he and many of his fellow construction workers have ditched the centre-left and switched to the Sweden Democrats, a party with its roots in the neo-Nazi movement that is riding high in the polls by focusing on the issue of migration. He says open borders has been bad for Swedish workers. It's not good for us who works in the construction, and we can't compete with them. I can't right, go so it's on. driving down wages, yeah, yes, driving yes. down prices. But, okay. You would like Sweden to leave the European Union? Yes, I do. I don't uh, believe in open uh, borders and everything. It's, uh, we can't stop what's coming into the country. We don't know who is in the country. All those international rankings, they don't ring true to Morgan. To him, it doesn't feel like Sweden is the fair and equal society that it once was. Lots of people uh, in Sweden would not agree with you. They would no. say life in Sweden is, is great. We yes. have very high standards of living. Most people are well off. Yes, uh, we have. So what's the problem? I, I don't know what the problem is, but we have a, I, I live good and I have it good, and many people have it, but we don't take care of the real sick ones and the real poor ones and the older ones. We don't uh, take care of them. I believe in the Sweden Democrats' policy to keep Sweden like it has been before. This country is changing fast. Back in Malmo, I kept returning in my mind to that phrase from the old documentary. All around the town, you can see the discrepancy between the Swede as he is and as he'd like to be. Not so long ago, voicing concerns about immigration would make you a social and political outcast. No longer. Public discourse is catching up with private thoughts. Let's take you back to Rosengard for a moment. Because what's interesting about the Sweden isn't working narrative is that it's shared by many of the second generation immigrants whose parents came here expecting some kind of utopia. No, no, it's not the reality. It's so the... far, far away from reality. What is the reality? It's hard to explain. They say it's very good to live here and like this. Okay, people live here, they have food, but they, are, they don't feel good in their uh, mentality, you know? Why? I don't know. Maybe it's the weather. <laughs> Hussein came to Sweden from Lebanon as a young boy. He's been out of work these past three years. As we stood chatting under the tree, there was a moment of journalistic serendipity. The newcomer is Abdurraf al Absi. He's a Syrian. He's been here for five years. And in all my reporting, I've rarely seen a happier refugee. And how is life? Yeah, quiet. What's he saying? He said that all the people here is equal. Really? Uh. It's really true, do you think? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behibba. Yeah, they are treating the front, uh, people from Syria very well here in Sweden. You know, you see now many of, of these Sweden people now, they are angry because of this man. They maybe don't like him because they say they came here from the war, they get everything, and we are sick, we cannot work, they don't give us money. We don't have to eat, and I am Swedish. And uh, do they have a point, do you think? Uh, I think they have right. We didn't see any people called Sven or Bjorn with blonde hair lying destitute in the street, but then we didn't go looking for them. And this is more about perception, a perception of unfairness. A survey last year ranked this the best country in the world to be a refugee, good Sweden. For decades, the people who run this country 
The politicians, the media, have been deeply invested in this narrative. But it's not the full story. You can live here all your life without speaking Swedish. Glenn Sjogren estimates that unemployment in Rosengard, where almost everyone is from an immigrant background, is 10 times the national average, maybe more. Bad Sweden. Integration has been a disaster. But until recently, to talk about that was taboo. We are not integrating good enough. You have to be, be straight and say, who is, is causing this problem? What would happen if you said that in polite society in central Malmö? I would probably be called a, a racist. Maybe a nazist. A Nazi? Yeah. I don't know why, because it's true. Do you think that political correctness failed that guy? In some way, yes. In what way? To see the problem as it is and do something about it. So political correctness is quite literally killing people? That's your word. That's, uh, uh, that's my uh, interpretation uh, of what you just said. Yes, but I, uh, yeah, but I not really agree. There's a lot of other things. I'm putting that, words in your mouth. That's right. A little bit. There's okay. a lot of other things that cause this death. Okay, it's a complex problem. Oh, yeah, it is. Before we go, and for the record, a British politician called Malmö the rape capital of Europe. Is that? <laughs> That's not true. Donald Trump said something too, I think. That's not good. You look at what's happening last night in Sweden. Sweden! Nothing had happened in Sweden that night. The American president had watched a documentary clip on Fox News the previous evening that painted Sweden as a failing state. Of course, it isn't any more than it's a utopia. Sweden is a lodestar in a polarised world. People come here looking for confirmation of their existing world view. The lesson they might come back with is this. Beware the simple narrative. That, and don't believe everything you see on TV.